Hey there, music fans. It's Dave for The Real Music Observer, and I had the opportunity to watch a good portion of the Chicago documentary Now More Than Ever. I'm going to do some quick observations. Band did a lot of drugs, okay? We figured that they did probably more than I even thought. The telephone booth, the cocaine booth, <laughs> wow. Um, they were totally serious about that. We find out that Peter Cetera and David Foster more or less had a coup to take over the band. That eventually failed because the band said bye-bye Peter and bye-bye David. And by the way, uh, Peter, Peter, I was going to call him Peter Foster, David Foster comes off as an arrogant jerk because he's like, I'm good at what I do. Look at all these Grammys. I needed to reform the band. They had nowhere to go. I don't know how they were produced before I got there. Well, <laughs> David... They were produced and they scored a lot of their own hits. Basically, all the engineer had to do was hit record and you had songs that became uh, giant hits, okay? That first Chicago album, Chicago Transit Authority, uh, all of the early Chicago work is what got them into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, David. Just, just wanna be clear. I do like the era that you started, um, but you are not Chicago, you are a producer. You are a good producer, but your production, the way you produce things, you don't like horns. We found that out. You and Peter don't seem to like horns, which is why the band was founded. It was a rock band with horns. It was not a rock band that needed to eliminate horns. And you may say, like on Look Away, which is Chicago's you know, fastest charting single ever, that horns weren't used and thus that validates the David Foster idea. The problem is that record was produced by Ron Nevison, who actually used a lot of crunchy top 40 production, uh, had revived groups like Heart, and if you look at the entire album on Chicago 19, uh, Nevison actually uses horns quite a bit and punches up the crispness and the volume. That's a trademark of what Ron Nevison does, if you followed his career at all, so. Whatever, David, whatever. Uh, we find out that Danny Serafin really couldn't play the drums back in 1989 when they fired him. Uh, they brought him back in. He couldn't play. They brought him in again. He still couldn't play. This is after all this rehab and stuff. Uh, they tried to teach him to play click, and they tried to, you know, he just couldn't do it. So Triz and Bowden comes along. They never look back. Serafin seemed to be kind of a drama queen. Early on, he was a great manager of the band. Early on, he had a very unique uh, playing style, but as the times evolved and the technology changed, Danny kind of lost his way. That's what we find out. Whereas Triz and Bowden seems to just power his way through the drums. We find out that the current lineup of Chicago might be their best lineup. We find out how great Lou Pardini is. We find out how great Keith Howland is, a great, probably the best ever replacement for Terry Kath. Uh, we find out that the band is still grieving and mourning Terry Kath, and that's not surprising. Uh, we find out that Bill Champlin was pretty much an egomaniac, and Jimmy Pankow said, bye-bye, <laughs> see you later, because uh, apparently Champlin said something to the effect that everybody goes to these concerts because of me. Ooh, my. Uh, no, Bill. No, we didn't. We didn't go to Chicago concerts to hear you scat and do all of this vocal outer bounds, out of bounds gymnastics crap that you do on songs that we just want to hear the freaking song. Okay? We don't want to hear you going off on your jazz routine and and showing us how you can be, you know, the Count Basie era of jazz scatter. You know, we, we it just it it didn't work for me. Uh, Champlin wouldn't be a known quantity if Chicago didn't come along with Foster and say, hey, do you want to join the band? I think Champlin, in hindsight, was a good replacement for the 1980s, but he he was not a Terry Kath. His voice isn't really that close to, to Terry's voice. Um, I think Lou Pardini is a much better replacement and has shown a lot more class and grace. Uh, and at one point, even... Pardini said it was like having an outer body experience being in Chicago when the band would break into beginnings, okay? Now, the documentary, I thought, was very good, very comprehensive, 
covered the early days well, covered the drug days, covered sort of this fall from grace in the early 80s, uh, the whole Peter Cetera saga, uh, and even right up into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction where Cetera faked his fans out and said, oh yeah, I'm going to be there, and then pulled the plug and didn't show up. I mean, that's crap. Let's hope that Steve Perry doesn't do that to Journey. I'd like to see Steve. That's another video, by the way, because we found out that Journey is getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I will do a video on that because I know all the Journey freaks are going to come out of the woodwork. Um, but this Chicago documentary was amazing, right through... Hey, I loved Walt Perizader throughout the entire thing. Gracious, diplomatic, informative. He was the guy during the entire thing who I thought was level-headed. Danny Serafin, we find out, is a loose cannon. <laughs> he wants to beat people up. Uh, and there were rumors that Danny wanted to punch a few people out and had some anger management issues, and apparently that was true. So that's my quick synopsis of Chicago now more than ever. I'm probably going to go out and buy that and keep watching it a few times. And if I find some more interesting observations uh, or things in there I can observe, I will, I will go ahead and, and put out another quick video. But if you didn't see it, it was on CNN. It was January 1st. It was New Year's Day night. started at 8, and I think it got over about 9.30 or so. It was the best rock documentary I've ever seen. Anywho, my name is Dave for The Real Music Observer. Subscribe to the channel. Tell your friends. I'm just a guy who used to be a DJ, program director, station manager at a couple of radio stations in my past. And I do still have a passion for real music. That's why I call it The Real Music Observer. We'll talk again soon.